Good morning, everybody. My name is Tom Divick. It's been a, I've had the pleasure and privilege of teaching middle school and high school kids at Charlotte Latin for nearly 25 years. And I've taught STEM education in particular, science, technology, engineering, and math. And I've had the good fortune of working with folks at McClintock schools, as well as other area of schools and after school programs, and done, worked in partnerships with both Discovery Place and Post. And what I would really like to talk to you about the good work folks are doing in these areas and how we do go about teaching children STEM education. Okay, so let's start this off with this guy right here. This is Socrates. And the title of my talk is STEM teachers sit down, Socrates is dead. Well, he's still dead, so let's have the talk about why I'm saying that. First, we've got to talk about what STEM education is. It's science, technology, engineering, and math. So you say, okay, Tom, we've been teaching that. Um, Socrates was teaching us math thousands of years ago. We've been teaching science, if you think of the Enlightenment age, for several hundred years now. And if we talk about technology, let's say that's computers, we've been doing that about 20 years from now. And so really what we're doing is we're talking about engineering. Okay, we can get that. Could everybody do me a favor here? Just make sure we got my phone off here. Uh, the irony of my phone going off with technology. Let me ask you this. Got these phones in there. How many people right now use their phone for both business, pleasure, every time, use it all the time, either consider it the greatest part of their existence or the worst part of their existence? <laughs> Raise your hand if you're right up there. All right, folks, keep your hands up. Now, keep your hands up. Bear with me. Now, let me ask you another question. How many of you folks understand how this works? Everybody's hands up. We're all dependent on this technology, me as much as anybody here. Doesn't it concern you that your business and livelihood dependent on this and we don't understand how it works? I'm not talking about operating it. I'm talking about how it works. Now, for that matter, <coughs> let me give you a quick explanation. This is nothing more than a glorified radio. Your cell phone is a radio. A very specialized radio, but a radio nonetheless. And the towers that connect your radio are arranged in cells. And they allow you to share frequencies. That's how a cell phone works. But I hope it made us take pause of we're relying on technology like that. And in fact, here's the cell tower right there. I didn't pop it. But that's how they're just arranged. Now, my question or thought for you all right now is, when has this happened in the past? I can give you a perfect example of this, folks. Civilization, at the height of its powers, you need to use this technology for both communication, business, commerce. It was the heart blood of the city. Of course, I'm talking about Rome. At the height, Rome was one million people, and they were getting 300 gallons of water per citizen. That's 300 million gallons of water piped into Rome every day. By today's standards, that's impressive. All right, you see this aqueduct? It's huge. This is actually in France. That's how big the empire was and where they were building these things. And they were using something called concrete, something we had to reinvent 150 years ago. So did the Romans all understand the technology? Probably not, probably like us. But their enemies certainly did. And they shut off the aqueducts, brought Rome to her knees. Rome couldn't support her troops anymore. The troops out in the outposts couldn't maintain the roads. Roads aren't maintained, fiefdoms pop up because the, Rome, the empire is falling apart. That gives rise, one of the things that will give rise to the Middle Ages, where there is no education to speak of, where we lose the ability to make concrete, where we can't even do math that Socrates was doing. All right? So I'm just driving home the point on part of technology in our lives, and we take it for granted. The next point I want to point out to you for, and the reason why we're very concerned about STEM education, 
is if you think innovation is the key to jobs, which I passionately do believe, then it needs to come from STEM education. Give you another number there. 50% of the jobs created in the last half of the 20th century, 1950 to 2000, were created because of technical innovations. TVs, phones, etc. Probably the last 20 years, the most recent 20 years, I'd say it's even a greater percentage. And that's why our competitors across the world and schools everywhere are spending a lot of time learning about technology and engineering and STEM. So think of it this other way. You've got a new idea, gets a better product, new jobs, prosperity. Our, our economy is based on this technology now. Now, there is an issue we've got going on here, is we would want as many new ideas as we can get so we can get more products out there in the marketplace. And in fact, this, this summer, I spent a lot of time with the aerospace industries. And this will give you a perfect example of this. They were in areas that had 9% report, reported unemployment. Folks, it's probably closer to 14%. In underserved communities, it's even much higher. And guess what? They had jobs going unfulfilled. This relates back to what President Obama said about CPC and the mechatronics program they have here. A fabulous program. So why aren't we getting more kids into this? Look at these numbers. The United States, we've been flat. We're producing the same number of engineers, and, and when I say engineers, I'm talking about programmers, applied mathematicians, physics, these people. All right? Imagine, four million ninth graders. By the time they graduate, there's only 167,000 pursuing these careers. If you do basic supply and demand economics, the top 20 paying college degrees right now. We got any students in here? Listen up, folks. They're all using applied math. All right? So there's the demand. And our rate of people going into this is flat. At the same time, we're teaching the test. So folks, in the after school programs out there, I'm really talking a lot to you today because we need you out there helping us in after school programs. All right? We need that help because at 167,000, that's not nearly enough. There's many of the jobs are going uncalled for. So what are we going to do about it? How are we going to improve this? Well, I'm going to give two simple things that I'm going to throw out that we can be doing. And it relates to what our earlier speaker was saying about technology being out and everywhere. We're going to use those tools. First thing I want to say is we've got to have engaged programs that are academically rigorous. And I'm going to show you those three things. I'm going to show you three examples of those programs that will get your kids pumped up. Kids run to my classroom. I have to chase and the lead. It happens at Charlotte Latin and it happens at McClintock. David Taylor does a great job. And there's cabins in a lot more other classrooms out there. The second thing I want to say, you don't have to be a sage on the stage to do this. You don't have to be an engineer necessarily to teach these things in the beginning. You may learn like an engineer, and you'll be able to do it yourself. So for those folks in our after-school programs, there's lots of resources so we can help you do this. And from those people that are qualified, I would say get out of the way. Set your classroom up, bring the kids in, make the focus on the kids and what that learning is that day. For example, right now we have robotics competitions across this country. Charlotte Latin, we hosted the regional competition. It's also hosted in Concord. It's at the state. These are, from the ages of these kids, fifth, sixth graders, they will learn, and it's measurable learning too, electricity, simple machines, they will use math it's in terms of programming to solve 10 robotic problems, as well as doing some research. These kids are highly engaged, very fired up about what they're doing. And they're doing a lot of very active learning, and it's all the higher level learning, the things that employers want to see. Can you solve a problem? For example, my eighth graders, listen again, I said eighth graders, help me convert an S10 truck from gas to electric. They asked me, where do you put the throttle, Mr. Dubik? Because I handed them the throttle they're going to use the stage. I said, I have no idea. You're going to have to figure it out. So they're doing things that are outside of the book. For those of us all graduated from college, you can remember. You got your first job, you realized you never used much what your book, what you did in college, other than it was teaching you how to think. 
This one, West Point Bridge Design. These seniors are doing file folders. But this program can be worked with middle schools and with high schools. Middle school kids are using Connect spreadsheets. They're calculating the cost of their bridge because they're going to build a bridge that can hold the same amount of weight for the least amount of money. These kids are using file folders, so the materials aren't necessarily expensive. The software is free. It allows them not only to build the bridge, which anybody can do, they are using trigonometry, doing free body diagrams, what's called method of joints. If anybody is in here an engineer, you remember taking that class your second, either your sophomore or junior year as you did it. Does that make sense? So we've got kids that are fired up and excited and doing things that we didn't think they could do, frankly. And this last one, we have middle schoolers across this country that are building, designing, and flying virtual airplanes. They're doing the math that goes through this. Nobody's asking at the end of these classes, by the way, why do I need math? Because we try to design the great programs, design the math, that the math is actually a tool. It's not contrived. They actually, by doing the math, they see they're going to save some time. And that's what we want the kids to see. Can I also say this? This is a little off topic, but bear with me. For all the parents in here, do not walk into your classroom and brag in front of your kids and the teacher, I couldn't do seventh grade math either. Would you brag about being illiterate? But you'll brag about being enumerate. Don't do that. All right? Thank you. I'd appreciate it if you not do that. Um, <laughs> the final thing, I really want you to think about two things. One, do we want our children to be creators of content or just consumers of content? Do we want to be creators of technology innovations or simply consumers? And finally, in all these programs, if you really think about it, it's really not about the kids building robots or bridges or airplanes. What it's really about is building future engineers. Because they're not just building robots, we're building engineers here, folks. Thank you very much.